Hi, this is Debbie, and we have another episode of Creative Love Radio, and this one's going to be great. It's about the psychology of physical attraction. Welcome to Creative Love Radio with Debbie and Dr. Rob. With love, the old rules of dating and commitment no longer apply. The technology's changing, roles are changing, as women are stepping into their power all around the world, and the way to approach relationships needs to evolve with them. We are redefining relationships to guide you to greater love, more success, and living your purpose through the latest research in neuroscience, Jungian psychology, and Eastern wisdom. Get ready for another inspirational episode of Creative Love Radio. Welcome back. Today we're talking about physical attraction. I'm Dr. Rob and uh, I'm here with Debbie. Hi. Physical attraction. Everybody's favorite topic. Yes. This is what, uh, one of the biggest questions we get from people is how come, what hap- what does it mean about my mind when I don't find anyone attractive and I'm going online and I'm looking and there, absolutely no one is attractive to me and how can I go on a date if I can't even get past mm-hmm. that physical attraction and then when I do get attracted, how come it's always with the wrong person? Yeah. Well, let's back up a little bit. And, let's back up. And think about... What are we talking about when we're talking about physical, first of all? So obviously we exist, uh, to, to, we're present to each other in this physical form, right? We cannot experience each other in any other way except uh, that we have bodies <laughs> and that our bodies uh, look good for, to each other. Um, and sometimes they don't. Right. There's this whole uh, culture and um, kind of uh, psychology that goes into who we find attractive, why we find them attractive, and then all this biology of what's going on in our bodies, you know, kind of by nature, Mm -hmm. the birds and the bees, that attracts us, compels us to uh, want to merge with this other body. So physical attraction is, can be different than sexual attraction, because you can look at someone and say, oh, they're, they're a nice looking person, they're attractive. But you don't have that like need to urge to merge with them, <laughs> right? So uh, we know there's uh, it's called biophilia mm-hmm. that we love nature, mm-hmm. right? We and by nature we love beautiful things, things that are beautiful to us. So a tree, for some reason, we find it beautiful. Why do we find it beautiful? Nobody knows except that. We're nature itself, and nature appears to be beautiful to us. Like the ocean? The The ocean, the sunsets, the mountains, yes. And this ideal of beauty appears to carry out uh, or carry over into the way we observe the opposite sex, that we have this idea or, or an ideal, let's say, of what is a beautiful woman, what is a beautiful man mm-hmm. in our mind already, and that we're reacting to this ideal imprinted in our mind, in our psyche already, and looking for this ideal. All right? And whoever comes closest, <laughs> we say, they're hot. Uh, you know, I want them. I, you know, I need to be with them. So re- in recent, uh, uh, let's say in the past, 15 years, people have started to look seriously at some of the biology going on in in physical attraction. Because before that, it wasn't considered a viable, a true uh, research topic, Mm -hmm. right? If you were looking at, yeah, what makes sense? I'm studying cancer. Well, I'm studying (laughs) physical attraction and why people are attracted. Yeah. But it it has to do with the the propagation of the species. We want to understand mating, right? Yeah, and it's an interesting topic also because um, it's such an important aspect of being happy as a human being mm-hmm. to to create a family and to be with the, the person that you love and all these things. And, and be attracted to them, right? Yeah. Like a lot of people ask me, if I settle down and have a husband, am I going to be attracted to him? Like that's the biggest fear is that they're not, I'm like... Well, you wouldn't marry someone you're not attracted to. But I guess we look at our friends that are married and we think, eh, I don't look at, she's settled. He's not that good looking or, you know. He's well, and then you have the phenomenon of, of arranged marriages, for yeah. example. 
uh, and they seem to work uh, better. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> than mate selection, the way it's done in in a lot of By Western default. cultures. Yes. Yeah. So it's not that clear cut, right? It's not that simple to explain away. So if we start with the the mechanism, let's say the biological mechanisms, right? We know. When we look at an, uh, an attractive face, an attractive body, our brain reacts in a certain way. Like, first of all, we're, we're primed to look at symmetry, mm -hmm. right? Is the person symmetrical? In other words, does their right eye match their left eye and all those parts? And the ears, like supposedly the, si the, the placement of the ears and the jaw and the, yes. all that uh, align, right? Even even as babies, uh, a baby will tend to look at a, an attractive face, a symmetrical face, more than an asymmetrical face, right? So it's already primed in our in our system to look for beauty in that way as symmetry. Now our brain, what it does, it it starts to release these feel good hormones uh, and neurotransmitters like dopamine. In, in large quantities in w when we see a beautiful person. Right, but releasing that, in our minds, not sending... In right? our brains, yeah. yeah in our not, nervous it's system. not like releasing it out through our skin and going... Oh, no, no. <laughs> well, those are... The, the that's a whole other... Yeah. yeah, that's a whole other study, and uh, they're called pheromones. Now, the, the research on pheromones is still uh, iffy, but there is some good evidence as far as animals that They use a lot of pheromones, and so we probably use them too, but we haven't really f uh, found the, the good stuff yet. But there are these pheromones that we release into the atmosphere and that... Uh, like our sweat and our body Yeah, there, there's scents uh, that the other person picks up through uh, their senses and responds. Right? It's almost like um, it would be like uh, our unconscious reads the DNA or something and finds if it's a match, that kind of... Yeah, something like that. I mean, to in a simple way, or to put it in a simple way, uh, we can pick up whether the person is receptive to mating, Ooh. and to copulating, and to reproducing <laughs> from scent and from vision visual cues that we're not even conscious of, mm. right? So unconsciously, we're reading each other's uh, viability for reproducing. And are you in a state that is ready for reproduction, like the ovulation and menstruation and all that is communicated unconsciously? So it's an incredible thing that's happening and we are not even aware of it, right? Except for this research, we're starting to see all these things going on. So in the brain, as far as we know, this feel-good uh, uh, neurotransmitter, dopamine, which is very similar to what we experience when, uh, let's say, we are high on drugs or high on... Uh, ice cream. Ice cream or anything like that, Wine. anything that feels really good, <laughs> yeah. it is, is released in our, in our brain. So a lot of people talk now about uh, relationships as, as an addiction. But that, that's ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's not really an addiction to see something beautiful and to be attracted to it. Yeah, right? it's a natural instinct yeah, more than an addiction. Yeah. but It's just when we it, we use it too much where we define ourselves. Well, they talk about it in, in terms of addiction in, in the sense that, let's say I, I get used to being around a, a beautiful woman like yourself, Aww. and then if you, if you go away... But, right. I, I go through withdrawal symptoms. Yeah. I, I miss you. I, I, I tend to very it, physiologically, I will experience a withdrawal very similar to being uh, taken, a, to having a drug taken away from mm -hmm. me that I'm addicted to. In that sense, I guess it's similar. Mm. But of course, there's deeper layers to our mind than just physical stuff going on. Right? Yeah. But, but the physiology is important. Because again, it's the way romance starts, right? We ha we can't get romantic with someone until that we have a physical attraction, right. really, truly. Yes. So, 
at the short term level, neurotransmitters kind of cue us to feel good around a person. Therefore, we want to be more around that person. And then on a longer term basis, let's say we, we date for months or at least weeks, hormones start to kick in. Mm. You know, um, certain, certain hormones cue us to be attached to that other person. So we not only have neurotransmitters working on the immediate basis, but then we have these longer lasting hormones that are enacting actual physical changes in our brain and our physiology that uh, keep us attached to this other person. Right. And we just think they're because they have a cute smile or <laughs> they drive a nice car or they have a good personality, that that's why we're so attracted to them. And then there's also the psychological element of it, not just the biological. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. So it's working at many levels, right? And nature wants us to stay together mm. and be together, right? So the, but the physical attraction begins with these visual cues, which includes body language, uh, and then those those unconscious cues that we're not even aware of, uh, like the pheromones, Mm -hmm. then the neurotransmitters, and then the hormones that are kind of longer lasting and longer acting. So it's a very powerful mechanism these mechanisms are very powerful and they they can shape our behavior in ways that make it appear as if we're choosing mm-hmm. consciously but in reality we're being driven by them mm-hmm. all right so a lot of the work we're doing is it's not to try to override those things but it's to try to have a say so beyond the conditioning of that biology Mm -hmm. that's going on already. And let me ask a question then. If if we're conditioned biologically to be attracted to a certain type, we can actually change by becoming conscious of it, of why. So, for example, I never dated men with any facial hair. My dad had facial hair. And, like, I think unconsciously it represented, like, maturity and... Um, a, a kind of a controlling male in my life. And so when I met, saw your picture, I was like, oh, he has a mustache, like immediately. But I was like, oh, let, let me override that. And I saw your beautiful eyes and everything else about you. And I was like, hmm, okay, he's cute. And so, but but if I didn't kind of do with the other work about with my dad, like psychologically, like kind of the projection I was having with my experience with men in the past, I would go for that type or go for a certain type physically because of my psychological conditioning, but you can actually change it. So you're actually changing your biological response to, yeah. to people. Exactly. Attraction, right? Right. It's not that we just want to reject what we've been conditioned to, yes. but it's that we want to have a choice. Mm-hmm. And then if you choose to choose somebody like your father, the, well, great, but it's a conscious choice instead of... Rejecting someone because right. they have a mustache. Or exactly. Rejecting someone because they're bald or, yeah. or someone because they, you know, have a, are too short or too tall or whatever it is that we, we, that biologically is driving that attraction. We don't even know the person yet. We're making all these judgments on just their physical appearance. Right. So if we look at the data that we that's out there let's say in the in the current uh, psychological scientific uh, literature mm-hmm. we see two opposite ends of the spectrum there one is on the biological end we know a lot about genetics now about epigenetics and and the, the neurotransmitters and the hormones that are going on in mating and mate selection and then on the opposite end of the spectrum, we know a lot about the sociological uh, numbers and, and customs and, and trends that are going on at the social level. We know very little about what's going on in the middle ground, which is our individual experience of relationships and love, right? How do we put all that information to work as individuals and how do we? How does that help me? In other words, how mm-hmm. does how does knowing that oxytocin, some hormone, 
is important in in attachment. How does that help me in my you know dating it's not practical. life? Practical. Yeah, it's uh, I, unless I'm going to inject hormones. <laughs> into I'm going to go on a date. Let me inject some <laughs> hormones so I can have more attraction. Hey, you know that might could could be a, a new new product <laughs> someone will come up with. Right? Yeah, so so it's it's baffling in that uh, many people are so tuned in tune to finding out more about the science, but uh, not really demanding a practicality to it. And it's, the psychology is important. Absolutely. Besides, besides just the physical. Yeah. Uh, so, so in our work, we want to know bo- about both ends of the spectrum. We want to know about the biology, absolutely. And we want to know about the culture and the sociology of it. But we want to know how do we apply it in our practical, everyday experience of me uh, choosing a mate, experiencing a relationship, and working at a very practical level with those things. So how do we do that, Rob? The, the best answer that we, we have is that we need to understand our own psychology, mm-hmm. right? our own mind. That's why we start with the persona, uh, the way we build up our persona, because that's going to help us understand the way we've been presenting ourselves socially. Then we go into the shadow because that'll help us understand what we've been rejecting and what we've been projecting out there into the world. And it helps us account for, oh, I see now the patterns of relationships that are happening and why they've been showing up in my life. And then the whole idea of transforming those aspects of my conditioned mind. Mm -hmm. How is that going to help me relate? Well, it'll help me have a choice in the things that are coming up, the patterns that are replaying. I will be able to observe them as they're happening and be able to affect some change in them at will. In other words, not by injecting some hormone into Mm -hmm. my bloodstream or not by knowing that... Uh, you know, 50% of the people are getting divorced and all those sociological elements. But by understanding my own uh, psychology, my own mind in relationships, in actual relationships. So can you give an example of that (laughs) in a practical way? Yes. That's a very big concept. So I want to bring it down for everyone. Right. So if I know, for example, that uh, I created a, a persona, let's say, that is very uh, intellectually minded. Right? I I love books. I I mean, I, you know, I collect books for a living. Basically, <laughs> I keep Amazon to my in business. <laughs> and a that persona, obviously, the shadow of that would be ignorance. Somebody who doesn't is not interested in books and is more interested in just the, let's say, the physicality of relationships. Or superficial, yeah. yeah. Whereas at the persona level, at the conscious level, I would be attracted to somebody who's intellectual, right? I want to be able to discuss my books and ideas with the, with my mate. And then you found me. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, let's say, let's put it this way. If I was unconscious, right, If I if I didn't understand my shadow... I would attract somebody who is not interested in in books. Yes. Right? I would end, end up basically attracting somebody who would say, why are you, why are you wasting your time reading all those books? <laughs> or like someone very physically attractive, like a pretty woman, but doesn't really, is more worried about the fashion or, you know, not that that's shallow or anything, but like, you know, kind of like her looks and, and her hair and, and she wants to go to the mall all the time and... Yeah, like that. And you'd be like, why can't she like... And you almost like like resent her for being so Ex- ignorant. Right? Exactly. Because that would be my shadow. Mm-hmm. And I would attract somebody like that right mm-hmm. into me, right into my life. But you would be physically <clears throat> attracted to a woman. You know, the physical yeah. attraction oh, yeah. would be there. The attraction. But the psychological attraction would be the opposite of what you are. Yes. So that's very interesting, right? So the practicality, you see it right away. Now, now I can... I can make a choice, mm-hmm. right? Uh, if I don't care and say, okay, I can live with that. I can, you know, just read my books on my own and I don't have to discuss it with my mate. 
okay, if I choose that. But if I really want to discuss these things and include that in my relationship, then I can choose. I can say, no, I want to create a relationship that's going to be more balanced. Well, here's the thing. You're, you're creating that idea that of intellect, like the loving of the books. You're not doing it where some people read a lot almost like um, to compensate for feeling ignorant. So that would be the shadow, like this, like almost like a egotistical, like I'm so smart, uh, where someone who just making a choice because it's something they love is much different then, so that that's the thing with picking partners and, and what we the traits we want in a partner is not from compensation. So you can pick someone like I wanted someone who was spiritual, not because I enjoyed that. I mean, that's what I thought, but it was more like I didn't feel spiritual enough, and I wanted someone who can kind of lift me up or raise my consciousness. You know, like almost like my own insecurity of my own spirituality, where I couldn't find my match. And so what I kept on getting were these very attractive men that were kind of babies and spiritually. And I was like the teacher and it kind of kept me in control and, you know, but it wasn't really um, an equal match until I would became conscious of it. So that's where the disconnect happens with all of us is that physical attraction and then our shadow, sometimes our, uh, the opposite of what we want shows up in that physical, we're physically attracted to someone, but psychologically they're not fitting or there's something missing in what we what yeah. we really want and also pra- in practical terms we know conditioning has a powerful effect early on so for example i'll give you a clear example okay good <laughs> in in my family the women in my family had long luxurious hair almost all of them had these this long luxurious hair and i you know when i was a kid I equated that with beauty, with warmth, with love, you know, with feminine beauty, feminine Mm -hmm. qualities. So if I was not aware of my shadow, uh, that is my conditioning, all that kind of programming that went on early on, I would be attracted to women who only had long, luxurious hair, Mm -hmm. and I would tend to reject somebody... With short hair or thin hair. Yeah, and and they might have been great for me, but because of that element, I would find a a reason, a rationale to reject them. Just like me with facial hair. Exactly. And so that's the limiting factor right there, is that if you are not conscious of this aspect of your mind you're going to respond in a very limited way to physical attraction. And you're going to think, that's my choice. That's my type. Yeah, yeah. that's my type. Or I, I just have chemistry with this person, <laughs> these kind of people. And I don't have a choice, really, in reality. And as to the extent that you're conscious of this and you're able to free your mind from the conditioning, you, you're free to choose and you're free to make much wider choices that are more congruent with who you really are, your genuine self, instead of that just early programming that went on early on. You know, one thing I forgot to mention that I think would be a great way to end this uh, this show is we all basically gauge, we have an idea of how attractive we are. You know, we have a kind of a, a relative idea and then we have a we have a kind of a rating system that we judge others by attractiveness based on culture. Some cultures like certain body types. Some cultures like certain color hair, eyes, and skin. You know, just all different uh, aspects of the physicality. And but attractiveness in general, we think, am I at eight or a seven? And then we look for someone who um, who matches our attractiveness. And if someone unattractive uh, approaches us, so that we hear, I hear this all the time online, and I used to feel this way too, like, why would that person think I would go out? Like, is that all I can get? Like, that's that kind of feedback we get. The, the, you see all these unattractive people, or that you call unattractive, approaching you online or in public, or, you know, people setting you up, and you're thinking, is this all I can get? It's almost like this if I meet someone attractive, that proves that I'm attractive. And so when we think of physical attraction in general, think about how attractive you are and how much you are putting on that other person being attractive to feed your own value. 
And so when you're thinking, um, you're triggered by unattractive people, what you're seeing is your own shadow of you're not attractive. The parts of you that don't feel attractive, you are projecting onto that person. And so that's why we get triggered with attractiveness and that own personal, um, basically rating system we have in our mind is really how we rate ourselves. Like you say, by the yardstick, we measure others, we measure ourselves. And so from physical attraction standpoint, just in general of attraction, it really is how much we're aligned with our self-worth and, and what we feel like is equal and what we deserve. And, and we even like judge as our other couples, like she's so pretty and he's not that great looking. Like how many times have we said that? Or, you know, they, they or they look like a good fit together. They look alike. They, they kind of match, um, as, as, you know, um, you see a lot of judgment of the older guy with the younger wife, you know, oh, you know, how could she be attracted to him or the, the younger uh, man with the older woman, same thing, you know, like they don't really fit together and, and how that, all that really has to do with our own conditioning and our own self, sense of self and how we pick people because it means something if they're attractive and everyone else agrees that they're attractive. Like, oh, do you think my partner, this new guy I'm dating is good looking? I mean, we all like ask our friends, like, is he cute enough, basically, uh, that we have a lot riding on that. Yes, uh, and there's nothing wrong with being unconscious of all that. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess if, you, if we leave it up to nature, it'll guide us towards, okay, who's the healthiest and who's the best uh, genetically matched for me, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll kind of look that way. And it would be fine if that's all there was to mating, was just the idea of reproducing, <laughs> right? Because then we'd find, okay, somebody is symmetrical, that means they have good genes, uh, they got beautiful skin, that means they, they're, they're ready for reproduction, they got hips and childbearing hips and all those things, right, that uh, cue us for reproduction, but we know there's a lot more to to the psychology of being a human than just finding a genetically <laughs> uh, viable match for us. Yeah, there's all this emotion and uh, romance that goes into relationships. Uh, that if we leave it up to chance, if we leave it up to just how we grew up and the families we were born into. We will simply play out a lot of the the same patterns, mm -hmm. right? We, if there's a if there's divorce in our families, we'll tend to repeat those patterns, or we'll try to reject and overcorrect for those things. We'll reject whatever happened in our early childhood and try to correct it somehow, and always be compensating. Mm -hmm. And either way, we're not free then. We're, we're being shaped and managed by our past conditioning. And the whole thing is that we want to be free. Mm -hmm. We want to be free to choose because we believe that's, that's the ultimate choice. That's really. what higher consciousness is, becoming conscious. Yes, that's it. And, and relationships give us a door into that freedom, mm. right? Because it, it shows us very clearly what our conditioning is, why we act the way we do, why we respond emotionally to pe certain people and, and not to others. And so it gives us a door into uh, that freedom. So when you think about attraction, look at your type. Look at maybe you start to notice the pattern of there's certain types that turn you off. There's certain types that trigger you. Sometimes it's, you know, someone who's not neat <laughs> or someone who uh, is, you know, a certain weight, you know, they're overweight or too skinny or too tall or too short or whatever it is. And then look at like in your life, like the role models of that opposite sex, what was pleasant about them and what was their body like and their body type and their look like, uh, did they look like them? Are you rebelling against that or are you aligning with the people around you that were around? And so um, that, that's the first step. And the second step is that we all know that physical attraction is the first step to deeper intimacy. So if you're not finding anyone you're attracted to, and it's a, you're not going on any dates, there probably is a deeper thing going on where 
you don't want to even take the step to get close to anyone. It's more of an emotional um, uh, defense to to even let anyone get close enough to even have a physical attraction. So what we want to do is open that up and ask, like, why is it that I'm rejecting everyone? You know, what is that about me? It's not that they're not out there, they're not attractive people out there, but why are you rejecting everyone? And what is the benefit of if you don't have anyone in your life, you don't go on dates, how does that keep you safe? And you just start asking yourself those questions and uh, it'll start to give you some answers. So great show, physical attraction. We'll have to go talk about this more in uh, future episodes. I think we need a whole whole show on sex, maybe a couple about sexual attraction as well. Absolutely. But uh, feel free to let us know what you want to hear about, what topics you want us to discuss. We'll be doing top new topics every week on Creative Love Radio. And I'm Debbie, and I'm signing out with Dr. Rob. See you soon. Take care. You've been listening to Creative Love Radio with Debbie and Dr. Rob. For more information, visit us on our website at creativelove.com.